welcome to Psychedelics today. It's such an honor and pleasure to have you here. Um, you've been very influential in my work. Um, but for those that don't know anything about you, I'd love to have you do a little bit of an introduction uh, to our listeners. <laughs> for me to do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, you know, I'm the developer of somatic experiencing, which over the past 50 years, which is now taught in 44 countries. Uh, and uh, I think about 60,000 uh, practitioners. So that's kind of a little bit my story. Uh, not my backstory, but my story. Uh, I've also received four Lifetime Achievement Awards and have written a bunch of books, starting with Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma, and now the most recent one, uh, in an, an autobiography of trauma, A Healing Journey. It's really about my healing journey. And so I've been on this journey and also reminding of it by doing different webinars. And actually, um, I suppose it's a little, can be a little bit tiring, but I really enjoyed the contact I've had with the different interviewers. Mm. Uh, yes. Also, at the same time, the autobiography is very revealing, in many ways tender and very difficult to write. But I am glad finally that I did write it and it I actually did a book signing on Sunday with a real bookstore oh awesome I know that would be my my thoughts exactly so anyhow uh, I'm here and and let's go Kyle yeah, let's chat about the autobiography. Um, you know, I've never taken any somatic experiencing classes or had any, you know, personal experience with you before. So I wasn't too sure, like, how this is the first time maybe talking about some of these stories. Oh. And when I started listening, I was like, wow, this feels like a very vulnerable book. Um, and yeah. I was wondering how hard was it for you to write? Because, yeah, you're sharing so much personal information about your, your life yes. and your healing journey. Yeah, exactly. It's really the backstory in a way. And you're right, it was very difficult to write. Actually, I didn't plan to write it as a book. You know, at, at my age, even though I'm pretty engaged and passionate and, you know, present, I, you know, I still am at the time in my life where there's much less time in front of me going forward than there was going from conception to where I am right now. So I, I wanted to do this more as a, an excavation, a personal excavation to kind of really find the trajectory of my life and talk about the influences, uh, both beautiful and also horrific, um, that came up in this excavation. And a friend of mine, uh, she said, Peter, you really need to publish this as a book. Mm. And I remember saying, there's no way, it's too raw, it's too vulnerable, it's the very tender parts of myself and, and my healing journey. And she said, well, I think you should think about it because I believe that many people could be helped by the book for their own stories, for their own healing. But I still couldn't make up my mind. So often in my life, uh, when I feel unsure of something or conflicted uh i'm <laughs> i'm appreciatively that a dream often will come my way mm, yeah yeah and so in this time where um you know i was again it, i would say conflicted i or stuck i mean i just really didn't know what my next step should be so in this dream i'm standing in front of a large field and I have in my hands a manuscript of some kind. It's also like typewritten pages. So it's some kind of a, uh, you know, some kind of a, a manuscript. And I look to the left, I look to the right, to the left. And again, I just feel more and more stuck. Mm. And in that moment, a wind, a breeze comes from behind me, a strong breeze, and blows all of these pages out into this meadow. Wow. to land where they might land. And when I awoke, and not all my dreams are like this, but when I awoke, I realized that my unconscious had made the, my preconscious had made the decision. So that's, that's where I started. Amazing. Um, have you shared some of this stuff publicly at some of your trainings and workshops or um, it was, is this pretty new for the public to really hear some of these stories? It is pretty new. 
uh, and it really is the backstory. Um, you know, the first time I presented it to a group, there's a conference called the Evolution of Psychotherapy. It's a pretty big one. They, they have like between four and 8,000 people attending. And the title of my talk was the title of the book, An Autobiography of Trauma. But I got up in front of this audience and I froze. The words wouldn't come out. Mm. And in that moment, I actually had just had lunch with one of my colleagues, um, Gabor Mate, and he, he and other people have written really beautiful endorsements. And I felt them literally at my side, all of these people, and behind me just having their hand on my back. I had that somatic image. And then the words came. And it hasn't been easy to talk about it. At, at different times for sure but i feel like it's the right thing to do because i do believe really strongly believe that people can be helped in their own healing journeys and in a way to write their own stories because we all have our stories our, our stories that are quite valuable and unique you know there's a uh uh isabella uh Allende, uh, she gave a TED talk and she quoted a Jewish proverb. What is truer than truth? Mm. Answer the story. And so, again, that's kind of how I began to pen this book as a book. And then it was just very recently released. It was just recently released, I think, just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Well, thank you for your courage and vulnerability, because I know that book is definitely going to help people. Um, I tend to think, you know, hearing some of these really personal shares and stories from people I've always looked up to has always felt really reassuring that maybe I'm not alone um, in this <laughs> okay. path. Right. Um, yeah. And I, you know, yeah. I imagine other people probably feel pretty similar, like being able to hear yeah. some of these stories and, um, yeah. you know, also an interesting backstory of like how somatic experiencing started to get developed in your, right. your, your own healing path. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's Chiron, the Greek mm -hmm. Mythology of Chiron, which I understand it in more modern terms, is about the wounded healer. And I think all of us who are therapists or different healers of different types, that um, we all have our wounding. Actually, indeed, the word trauma comes from the Latin injury or wound. And how we carry these wounds and how we can transform them, I think, is my is my contribution, my story. Yeah. What's something that you learned through this process of writing and also releasing oh, this uh, to the public? I think it is that I did what I was supposed to do. And the commitment I made in writing was to tell my truth wherever it might lead. And I think making that commitment made it more possible to write the book and to allow the book to come out into the public eye. Yeah. Did you Do you notice a difference of, say, verbalizing these stories, say, like in a group? I think about, like, you know, healing and how, how much a group can really hold that. You feel seen, you feel heard. But I can also imagine with the written word and writing it down probably also has another impact on the psyche or your own process. Indeed. And that happened in almost all the chapters. Mm. I mean, some chapters were not really about uh my tr my trauma and how i work through it but also how people have dealt with trauma since time immemorial that we ha have always had to work with or, or live with loss loss of those we care about loss of ourselves of, of our own mortality and um so I learned many things. I, I had the privilege of over the years of meeting some different shamans from different places around the world and how they dealt with, with loss and with trauma. 
and I had the wonderful opportunity to visit uh, the chief and his daughter, the princess of the Kranaki people. Mm. And if you make any contact with these people who live in the junk in the jungles, you have to get permission from FUNAI, which is the organization that protects indigenous rights. And so that was got approved. And it took like, I can't tell you how many hours, probably total about 20 hours to get there. Mm. The last few hours in the noonday sun, that's another story. And when we finally got there, the, 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 the chief asked me, I mean, he could see I was just sweating <laughs> profusely. So they had put a little plastic pipe in between two rocks and there was a, like a spring. And so he took me there and I stayed <laughs> under the, you know, under the, that wonderful shower, that fresh, cool shower. And I asked him, he said, asked me, well, why am I coming to see him? And I said, well, I'm, you know, my work is about trauma and I wonder how you understand sustu. And sustu is the Portuguese word for fright paralysis. And so I asked him about that and he kind of nodded and then invited me to go out behind the house uh, and, uh, and sit on, sitting on a bamboo mat with uh, under a, a mango tree. And again, I asked him the question. He said, yes, he knew about sustu he knew about trauma because his daughter was the first person in the tribe to actually go to college. So that's something that, you know, she told him about. And he, and anyhow, he started playing the flute. I asked if I could play with him. And he mm. said, of course, that's why they're here. And so we played the flute together for, I don't know how much, it was really timeless. That's why wow. I can't tell you how long it was. And then finally, I just felt settled. And I was open to hear what he had to say. And he said, yes, he knew about the words, both sustu and trauma, but there was something that I wasn't understanding. And that is how trauma occurs in the group and must be healed in the group, in the village, in the tribe. And that was an important lesson for me. Because as therapists, we're thinking more one to one, uh, right. the therapist, the healer, and then the patient. And, um, and so that was, an, again, I, I, I talk about some of those visits to different cultures. I think I have a chapter called um, many, ma many cultures, one race, the human race. And that's one of the one of the entries I talk about there. And um, I think, again, different tribes have had to deal with loss. Uh, you know, after this, I had a vague remembrance of the, an anthropologist named Colin, um, uh, um, I don't know, Colin, anyhow, forget his name, I'll, oh, I'll probably remember. And uh, he, uh, he, was a, he was an anthropologist, an anthropologist, uh, study so-called primitive tribes and so he did with the uh the pig the the uh, forest people the jungle people the forest people and instead of just you know most anthropologists are there and they have like a check off list how many times the person turned in a circle and you know whatever and but there's really no essence about who those people are and so uh colin turnbull mm. <laughs> turnbull he actually lived with these people for three years. Mm. And he learned so much about how people deal with loss in a community. And um, so, uh, so if somebody died, somebody had loss or, or had a, were very sick or something like that, um, the whole tribe would come together and all night long they would cry together and wail together together and then in the morning they would all go into the forest deep into the forest and dance ecstatically mm. dance with joy 
And that was how those wounds become transferred. So again, in my now my later years, I really like to um, say more about that because I think it's important. And I think it also fits in in some ways with some of the psychedelic use that's yeah become a yeah. Bit. Yeah, because group group use and group experiences will definitely be a big part of uh, the, the psychedelic um, kind of ecosystem. Um, as you're sharing that, um, something was just kind of popping up in my head around, say, you know, coming from Western uh, psychology, thinking about like evidence based practices and then sure. thinking about more of this kind of shamanic type of approach mm -hmm. or indigenous type of approach. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess like, what can we learn from that? And like, how do we maybe find the balance between um, both of it? Because your story also reminded me of um, Andrew Solomon. Uh, what he, he wrote the noonday. Uh, something. Oh, yeah. No noonday demon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he has a story on the moth. Um, you can find it on YouTube. But at the end of it, the punch, he's going through this, this uh, ritual um, in Africa. And there, it's like a healing ceremony. But at the end, I think he returned to the village like a, years later or something like that. <clears throat> asking how things were going. And I guess they had, uh, there was uh, some social workers there that came in um, to help okay. out with like some natural disaster relief and, and the trauma. And, um, you know, the, the, the main person uh, within that culture said, you know, we had to kick them out um, because they took us and they put individuals in tiny dark rooms to talk about horrific things that have happened to them. No. Um, and they're like, the way that we've always dealt with this is you go out in the sun, you get the sun, we dance together, we sing together. Um, and it's more of this like group process. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, this this uh, balance between like evidence-based practices versus maybe some of these indigenous types of perspectives that, um, I mean, they do seem to have great benefit, especially within the, the group context of coming together and thinking about, yeah, how does trauma feel different from these uh, yeah, perspectives? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think uh, evidence-based, of course, is the, the operative, uh, you know, um, I, I, I don't have a problem with evidence based actually in developing somatic experiencing. We did some very, you know, good uh, outcome studies and others. Right? So I don't, uh, you know, the way things are in our society, for something to be accepted, it needs to be evidence based. But that's not the reality. It's like Turnbull when he lived with the people and didn't just do evidence based you know, checklists. He really got to know them and know them by their names and know them by their individuality, individual and know, notice them as a collective. So I, I think that we, at this point, I think we have to hold both. Yeah. Both yeah. the evidence-based, but also the experiential aspect. Yeah. How has, I guess, like your practice or theory of trauma evolved um, over the years of like, um, yeah, really developing somatic experiencing, learning from maybe all these different traditions? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How did I come to develop somatic experiencing? Well, I was, for, I began, actually, there was a specific uh, event in 1969, which really took me on this path. But there were also other things during the, the, the uh, time, uh, the time before that. And um, I think I didn't have the advantage or the disadvantage, because it was only now another 12 years in the future, 13 years in the future of the definition of trauma as PTSD, with these very specific uh, components that, you know, that people had flashbacks and they were uh, agitated and hypervigilant, they had nightmares and so forth. But one of the things I discovered is this is something that just doesn't happen in the mind, in the brain, because at the, when it was actually defined as PTSD, it was uh, seen as an incurable brain disorder or maybe even a brain disease that could only at best be managed by medications and also uh, managed by helping people change their negative thoughts about themselves. So I really discovered, and again, I talked in the book about the it's called, a chapter called the, the Four Most Important Women in My Life. Mm. 
And these are women who really introduced me to the body. Because when I came out to Berkeley in 1964, I didn't know anything about my body. I didn't know I had a body, you know. And uh, so anyhow, as an example, you go outside uh, from your house and you see somebody's just um, hit by a car. And your guts go, yuck. Because our brains recognize injury, threat and injury sends a mis- message down into our guts, into our viscera, and our, vis- and our guts go, yuck. And if we see the person that's really, really injured, of course, we go to call the ambulance. But we also, um, uh, we even feel more of this, this gut wrench. And maybe that night when we're laying in bed, we start having flashbacks. Now, I'm not saying this is going to be a lasting trauma, but in a way, understanding, first of all, how it happens in the body, but how it can be shifted. Because when the body is in the gut wrench, it's telling the brain that this is a constant threat. And uh, there's a nerve called a vagus nerve uh, that goes from the back of the brain stem down and wanders to all the organs below the diaphragm and also to the heart and lungs and goes down there. And... Um, the word uh, uh, vagus comes from the Latin uh, vagabond because it wanders. It goes to all of our different organs. So when we experience threat and injury, our guts twist. But that nerve that goes from the brain all the way down into the guts, that nerve, and not that many people, even um, even medical doctors, are aware that 80% of that nerve is afferent so it's actually taking information mm. from the guts and bringing it up into the brain so if you ha- if your gut is contracting and you um, uh, in order to get a new signal from the an all clear message from the vagus nerve I de- I didn't know about the vagus nerve at the very beginning when I was developing somatic experiencing but clearly making an approach which now can say from the gut to the brain that the threat is over and you can leave it in the past where it belongs and this was important for me when i was experienced a violent assault and rape because of my because of the mafia and uh, how i was able with the help of one of my students to help me move through that trauma and put it in the back in the past where it belongs so um i guess <laughs> where am i going with this um so yeah yeah so again she worked with me and found out what was going on in my body and somatic experiencing we don't we almost never go right to the core of a trauma mm. we work around the edges around the periphery and we also work with other experiences that often emerge spontaneously in somatic experiencing, which contradicted those feelings of threat, of injury, of overwhelming helplessness. And um, so I had been experiencing some very problematic symptoms, sensations, symptoms, occasional quick flashes of an image. And I ask one of my students to sit with me to make an exploration of this. And again, the idea of Chiron, the wounded healer, we need to do our own work if we're going to be healers. We have to be able to be present with ourselves and present with others. So what came up first is more of a memory when I was about four or five years old. It was my birthday and in the middle of the night or early in the morning, my parents laid the tracks from a model airplane, uh, a model airplane, <laughs> a model train set, mm-hmm. a Lionel train set. And the tracks went underneath my bed, out into the room, back into the back of the room and then again underneath the, the, the bed. And when I woke, I don't really have the words for it. I was exhilarated, I was excited, whatever. I literally jumped out of bed 
and ran over to the transformer so I could control the speed of the train and make the whistle, you know, go hoot, hoot. And I didn't have the words for it then. But in that moment, which was so important because it was going to balance something that was the opposite, helped to balance something that was the opposite. And I knew that I was cared for. I knew that I was loved. And even if we only have one experience that in, like that in our lives, I've learned that the people will be okay. They may, well, they will have to work through things, but that they will be okay. And so, again, this is something that, um, that are, I think is actually fairly, is reasonably known at this time. There's been research on that, really, about someone who has that singular experience of knowing they were cared for and loved. Yeah. So, again, really embodying that, feeling it, sensing it, knowing it in my body, I was able to take the next step, what was really liter literally a step. And just a little background. Uh, for many years, my father was made to testify against Johnny Diaguado, Johnny Dio. And he was probably the most ruthless of all of the mafia. You know, he was featured in two films, The Goodfellows and also The Irishman. And when you wanted to violently kill somebody, he was the person that you chose, you gave him that task. So it, it, again, this is like a, a strange convergence of things um, that uh, my father was asked to, was made to testify against him. And every week or so on Friday, this person would come to the house and he was a lawyer. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was a lawyer from the mafia telling my father what to say and what not to say. But me and my brothers knew there was something wrong. It was never talked about. And eventually it was almost talked about in a, in a, cavalier way, you know, because if if he were in prison, you know, the family wouldn't have any money. And so he said something, well, that's not, okay, you, we'll just eat potatoes. And uh, so anyhow, I lived with that. And then in, I believe is what happened in order to ensure my parents' silence, my father's silence, I was assaulted and raped. But I never told my parents about that. In a way, I never told myself about it until these sensations came up, until I put myself in the hands of one of my students. And she noticed a slight, very slight shuffling of my feet. And, you know, with all of the stress of the mafia, it was like my feet were pulled out, my legs mm. were pulled out from under me. I lost the sense that I had legs, that I had any power. It was just really a shutdown. But after I would come home from middle school, from junior high school, I would run up to the house as much as I, well, yeah, and then I would have my milk and cookies, Pepperidge Farm um, cookies. And then I would go downstairs and go across the road into a park, which was called Reservoir Oval Park. At one time, it was a reservoir. And so I'd climb the fence, climb over, and run down the bushes. And below was a, a running track. And so feeling my feet, my legs, this sensation, this feeling, this body memory came of starting to slowly begin to walk on the cinder track below and then walking more fast, and then finally coming to a run, and then resting, and then feeling my legs, that they're starting to feel some power. And then this was a what allowed me to go to the work with the horror part of this story, which I won't mention here, it's not yeah. necessary. But again, when I talk about things like that in the book, I do it in a way that I believe it will help people to not be um, overwrought, but to also learn again how to heal our own traumas, our own issues. And you, we need to do that with help. 
even though I had developed this methodology, somatic experiencing, I couldn't have done it myself. I needed my student to be there. You know, in one of my books, in an unspoken voice, I say trauma is not so much or is not just what happens to us, but it's rather what we hold inside in the absence of that present empathetic other. And again, I think that's one of the understandings that I learned. It actually comes from a Motown song. Oh, really? it, takes, it, it takes one to stand in the dark alone. It takes two to let the light shine through. So we need at least a community of one other and maybe a bigger community. Yeah, thank you for sharing all that. And again, if people want to learn more about that story, definitely uh, get the autobiography of trauma that just came out. It's such a uh, fascinating book. And yeah, when you first opened up the the book uh, with that story about the mafia, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine like what that was like for your family and all the stress and anxiety, and then probably That's permeating right. down to you, right? Like you know, your yeah. father having to deal with that. Like, wow. And then again, nobody t talking to us and telling us something and letting us know that we were going to still be cared for, that we'll be protected. So again, that was kind of the milieu. And in many times, people who have early developmental trauma, it's not just what happens to them in terms of like PTSD, the, how it, that will affect us, but really how the whole environment, the holding environment, which was not holding, which was missing, which was weak, which was absent, really is what makes us more vulnerable to trauma. I think I'm just thinking back about my own experience and like the container I came back to after my snowboarding accident. And I think that mm -hmm. that had a pretty big impact on me. Yeah. You know, the trauma of the snowboarding accident was like one thing, but it was coming back to sometimes a container that I didn't always feel held in in some degree. I mean, obviously, you know, my family was there, loved me and cared for me, but there's, yeah, maybe some of that attachment stuff and, but yeah, how that's really impacted me. Um, yeah, so I think that's important. That's And I've learned over the years the safety, right? Like that feeling safe in your body and feeling safe with others is really, I think, that helps with, with the healing process. Exactly. It's, it's a sine qua non. It's essential. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to maybe shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about um, psychedelics, since this is our <laughs> psychedelic podcast. Um, right. And I would love to hear um, you share a story in your book about um, your experience with LSD and also how that's helped. Helped, um, with the development of somatic experiencing um, and just yeah wondering if you could share a little bit I mean you don't have to go in all the details because it's in the sure. book but you know sure. things like how that's helped you understand yeah. um, you know yourself yeah. trauma mental health the psyche yeah. well I mean I think that these first of all I have to say, I have to I have to confess that you know when I came to Berkeley in 1964 everything was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And so when I'm asked to talk about, um, about psychedelics, I, you know, I, in a way, I, it, it's a way, it's ironic. Um, again, how I was introduced. And the one experience that you talked about, you know, there's a wonderful, there was, I couldn't find it anymore. Maybe it's on Amazon, but there was a, 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 a documentary called The Last Shaman. Oh, yes. Yeah, I've seen that. It's a lovely one. And this is a young man who wants to, his parents care about him and so forth, but there's no emotional warmth. And so he's suffering from a pretty severe, what sometimes is called anaclytic depression. And they've tried drugs and they even, I think they might have even tried shock therapy. Um, but anyhow, he went to find the shaman that would guide him on an ayahuasca journey. And so each shaman he meets, he realized that they're just about money and about power over the person. So at least he has that enough discernment. But then finally he goes to a small mountain, mountain village. I forget somebody told him about it. And he meets this shaman, the last shaman. And the shaman takes him under his wing. And for a month, and this is in, again, in a, in, a, in a tribe where there's a lot of warmth. You see the children are playing and so forth. And um, he, um, he was t told to practice a particular ritual. 
we'll come back to ritual, which is important. To practice this ritual for a month, and then afterwards, there would be the possibility to do the ayahuasca guidance. And so he did. He, he not only did the ritual every day, but he was more and more connected with the family life there, which in a way was the opposite of what he had experienced. These are very simple people, but they are filled with exuberant warmth. And he was embedded in that warmth. At least that's the way I understand it. And then he does. He does take the ayahuasca and he definitely feels it was an improved his life. But it also wasn't the answer for everything. And when I write about psychedelics in the book, I, in, a, in a couple of chapters, in one of the chapters, I call it Psychedelics, Promises and Pitfalls. And I think they have great promises. The one you were mentioning, again, with my own held in grief. Um, you know, uh, when, when my uh, father's sister died, it was the first time I saw him having tears. And my mother said to him, Morris, tears won't bring her back. And I felt like I'd been hit in the gut. And then when my grandfather, who was a very important attachment figure for me, died, my mother told us, and I ran into the bathroom and locked the door so I could cry without my mother stopping it. But anyhow, that was kind of like, again, some of the environment from my early life. And so at one time, it must have been in 1965-ish, uh, I, uh, I was with a girlfriend and we were up, her father owned a ranch up in Northern California. And we were there together and we dropped some acid. And I felt myself going into this terror. And somehow I was able to ask her to hold me. And then I had an image, a hallucination, but an image of a tear filled with blood. And the middle of the blood was a beating heart. And I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed. And that was, I think, the beginning of breaking up that ice mother yeah. complex. And uh, also around 1964 or five, uh, you know, there was a drug that's now become fairly well known. At that time, it was called Adam yeah. MDMA. And so I also had a couple of experiences with this and a group of us actually, because it was completely legal at the time, a group of us were actually using that, um, that catalyst uh, to, good, to good use. And again, I think some of, the, some of the keys about working with psychedelics is it has to come into the body. There has to be preparation and there needs to be follow-up. And the follow and the preparation and the follow up must include learning enough to be in one's body. And I think that's one of the small contributions that I maybe make is the importance of that, like that young man who really prepared for it and who was guided and had follow up because he spent another month, I think, there with the with the villagers. Uh, you, uh, bonding with them and bonding with the children. So it's a whole complex, it's a whole milieu that I think that's so important. And also to use uh, what drug, dr what drug when, right? You know, I mean, there are a number of these drugs now, I don't want to even call them drugs, but catalysts. And they, they're all somewhat chemically different. They do have some similarity, but they're also quite different. And their effects are quite different. And to know the, where the person is, what kind of stability, foundation, what kind of um, grounding they have may also determine which, which catalyst to use and when. And again, to use it in a safe way, in a way that there's the adequate preparation and follow-up. And, you know, given that provisio, I think that they that these medications, that these 
catalyst that these plant substances and chemicals can really loosen, loosen things up, but it's not to take them over and over. Right. Because that's the work that we need to do. Otherwise, then it becomes a little bit like, well, it becomes like a panacea. Yeah. And that can be problems. That can be problematic. Yeah. You know, what you're sharing really reminds me of my own journey of finding psychedelics um, in my early 20s and really kind of going in because it kept reminding me of my near death experience. And I was like, you know, if I just hang out in this transpersonal realm, maybe I'll be able to like, you know, transpersonally figure out my life um, in, a, in a sense. Um, but I noticed it was like bringing me pretty far out there. And it wasn't until I stumbled across holotropic breath work um, through my um, school and, and two teachers were um, leading a, a weekend workshop that I got school credit for, which was pretty cool. Okay. Um, I came back to my body. Um, during that and said, Oh my God, I've just been really neglecting this and um, how important this is um, yeah. for processing. Cause I realized I was like trying to process the trauma, I think more cognitively and spiritually. Yeah. And I, you know, I was probably doing a, a lot of spiritual bypassing in a sense. And it wasn't yeah. until, yeah, I came back to my body. I was like, Oh my gosh, I needed to like have that yeah. catharsis, that reliving in a sense. Um, or that reuniting, reuniting. reconnection. Yeah. Yeah. No, again, I think that's absolutely essential to use these substances uh, effectively. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think that's, you know, what we've definitely been preaching uh, a while here at, at um, Psychedelics Today, um, because, yeah, I think people can get caught up um, just in the kind of seeking and, and the whole experience. Um, but what happens, yeah, when we can come back to the body and do the integration. So I guess like ideally, you know, you're, you're saying that prep and integration is so important. What would um, like body oriented preparation and integration look like for you? Well, again, you know, as a developer of somatic experiencing, which is a body oriented approach, it is about that. It is. And, you know, when I first came out to Berkeley, well, in 64, but I think 1965, um, I had a really good friend, Jack, Jack Kaplan, and he was a, he was a meditator in the Green Gulch uh, Meditation Center. And there was this program for the for the monks that were, you know, there uh, by a woman named Charlotte Selvers and her husband, Charles Brooks. And she's the first of four women where I write, I have a chapter, the most important women in my life. And she was the first. And these, again, these weren't romantic people. These were things that really helped, helped me develop as a person and as a therapist. And But what we did all day long is walk around this room. We would hold a, a rock in our hand, a stone, and we feel its temperature, its texture, its weight. And we did many things like this all day long. And it just seemed kind of ridiculous to me. And I remember catching the eye contact with one of the monks. And I said, how is this for you? And he said back to me, big headache. <laughs> but at the end of the day, when we walked out of the church, it's this magnificent church at the top of O'Farrell Street. Um, it's one of the grand churches. And we walked out the door and looked down into the valley with all of the lights and then across to the Bay Bridge. And it looked like the most beautiful thing that I had ever seen in my life. And I realized that I had to really attend to what was going in my body if I wanted to be able to have these open experiences, life changing, life affirming experiences. Yeah. So when you're talking a little bit about somatic experiencing, you said that you don't go to the core of the trauma, you work around the perimeters of it. And when I think about some of some of the ethos of, of psychedelics, right? Like kind of have this big experience, the way sometimes people talk about it, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're gonna go in, heal trauma, eye shades, having like this big deep mm -hmm. catharsis. What do you think about that versus maybe taking like, a, like, cause we don't, like in America, it sounds like the psycholytic kind of uh, psychedelic therapy hasn't really been focused on. It's mostly been on like these more high doses, mystical type of experiences versus, yeah. um, you know, something that could be a little bit more maybe titrated up or. Yeah. 
Well, I would say generally to use minimal amounts of the medication, certainly to start. But also one of the ways to prepare, you know, because you like wear earphones like you have and an eye mask, and then you and then you have a two therapists, a male and female therapist, which is good. And um, you then you do, then you take the the catalyst, and then you just go with different kind of music. There's a I think there's a good uh, one uh, that from the people who've worked with psilocybin at Johns Hopkins. That's a good um, uh, musical kind of thing. And uh, so I say no. The way we should start is do exactly what I was just talking about, but not taking the catalyst and to be there with several hours and to work with what comes up in that time. And then at a later time to take the catalyst because you really have focused about where you want to go, where you need to go. And I think that's another important aspect of uh, psychedelic use is again to really have clear intention and one of the things i've learned in developing somatic experiencing is that uh, we all have this powerful instinct to heal to become more whole to connect to a deeper self and i think that's one of the things that these uh, uh catalysts do is they kind of open us into that realm of self-healing of deep healing and so again a lot of preparation a lot of uh, knowing also the person's history even though you're not going to be focusing on that but you still as therapists really need to know that because those are things that are very likely to come up and how to work with them when they when they when they do come up so again i think there are just so many variables and to be successful, uh, it's pretty cl clear that we have to really take the preparation seriously and the follow-up seriously. And I said, I think in one interview, that I, that we should at least do 15 to 20 non-drug um, uh, sessions for every time we use a catalyst. So again, I just gave it as a, a number but what I was really saying is we just really need to to really take this seriously. I think, you, I mean, your work really um, was a big influence on this, uh, my master's thesis, uh, all about breath work and maybe how to, you know, use it in maybe a little bit more of a trauma-informed way. But that was something I thought about when I started um, offering ketamine to my clients um, a couple of years ago not practicing anymore. This has completely taken over my life in a fun way. But, um, you know, that's something I would do. I would have multiple sessions before even um, introducing the catalyst. We would, you know, do kind of some music. We would do a little bit of breathing, see how they would react, and also give them a little bit of the navigation skills before mm -hmm. going yeah. in, um, yeah, sure. which, yeah, I think is important. I also understand there's some critiques around, like, accessibility and, um, you know, how many sessions can people really afford and um, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So, yeah, it's... it's right. But, you know, I think yeah, it's for... interesting when you talk about ketamine. Oh, you can go. When you're talking about ketamine, we call that vitamin K. <laughs> <laughs> and again, back in the 60s, um, I, I was teaching at Esalen and John Lilly was there. Mm, oh, and he was, no, I would say he was abusing Abuse, vitamin yeah. K. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's, um, I've only experienced it once. And, it's powerful, but I think it's one of the more difficult ones to actually integrate because it's like boom, you're in a completely altered state. Um, and, you know, and there are some dangers. I, I know somebody who was using uh, ketamine and the person died. Yeah. You know, uh, and again, that's important uh, background information, medical work up and so forth of the of the person but there are so many other choices i think one of the thing reasons why by ketamine was popular 
is at that time, um, physicians could use it like off label. Mm -hmm. And they set up these clinics all over the place, these yep. ketamine infusion clinics. And I, when I heard about that and followed some of that. Oh, yeah, it was uh, horrifying. It was like, what are people is, doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do they think? I mean, they think, okay, it's going to affect the dopamine system, the serotonin, system, but it doesn't work like that. It affects the entire psyche. It's not about, <laughs> it's not about one, um, you know, one neurotransmitter system or the other and so forth. I mean, this went out of fashion many, many years ago when Prozac first came up out and they said, well, you know, depression is due to a, what did they call it? Uh, a, a, a not enough, um, what was the what was the one they said at the time? I don't remember. It wasn't serotonin. Yeah. It, it was oh, it's not about serotonin, 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 serotonin deficiency, and that that was what caused depression. So you have to change that. But it had nothing to do with that. It was just the selling point from the drug companies, you know, to to sell these to sell these drugs. But anyhow. Um, there are so many much more uh, catalysts and that are, are much easier to integrate. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I think MDMA is one of them because it's usually very soft and, and also really helps with uh, distance from trauma and self-compassion. I think it's, you know, it's a really good catalyst there. It does have an after effect. The person is usually in a low level of energy, almost like a depression. But again, the experience can really be opening some portals, some doors to explore, to continue to explore without the, without the catalyst. And uh, yeah. So yeah, hearing this word catalyst um, and, think, and as you're uh, talking about like receptor sites and serotonin, it has me some, uh, something on my mind that Stan Groff said in one of his earlier books. Um, and it's just on my mind because I um, just presented it in a class uh, this week. But when they first discovered LSD, um, you know, they thought they were doing psychopharmacology, pharmacology, and like trying to understand the drug and, and how it works. Um, and then Stan said, you know, we got to a point where we had no idea what was going to happen. And this didn't kind of fall under like normal pharmacology in a sense in that, you know, people weren't having quote unquote LSD experiences, but they were having experiences of their psyche. Um, and I hear you talk about, um, you know, this self-healing um, energy. I know Stan talked about like the inner healing intelligence. How do we like, I guess, conceptualize these ideas around psyche, like a catalyst to get in touch yeah. with the psyche, this self-healing without, I guess, sounding a little too, I mean, I'll, I'll use the word woo-woo, because I know some people can well, well, critique yeah. that, right? It's like, it's not always scientific. How do we talk about it? I think right now science is like, we want to look at receptors and the neuroscience and the brain. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I know Stan and uh, you know, he certainly was one of the pioneers in psychedelic therapy. He was working at this hospital in Maryland, I think, yep. in Bethesda. And we were talking once, because in Esalen, you can always sit, you know, at a table and there's a lot of talking going on, but you can sort of have a conversation. Must have been wild times at Esalen back then. <laughs> oh, they were wild times. And, you know, I asked him about, you know, about this, about his research, his work. And he said, you know, when he was in, I think he was uh, from Czechoslovakia. He said, when I was in Czechoslovakia, I had no personal fra uh, uh, freedom, but intellectual freedom to explore. And then when he came to the U.S., it was the opposite. He had little, uh, you know, uh, academic exploration, but he had personal freedom. And I think that was something that re I, f I think he was really saddened by that. And I think he could have done more. So, you know, the one person be or the two people before this, of course, that have to be, well, of course, indigenous people have used this stuff for <laughs> centuries. But um, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When uh, Hoffman, uh, no, no, yeah, Hoffman at Sandoz Laboratories. He was a scientist there, and he was working with uh, ergotamine, and uh, he synthesized that. 
and he accidentally, I think, took a whiff of it or something like that. So he's bicycling home, and all of a sudden, he's tripping, you know, and he actually talks to a colleague of his. Uh, I think his name is Osman, and he he was in in northern uh, Canada, in Saskatchewan, I think. Mm -hmm. He he was the the director of a hospital, a psychiatric hospital, and so talking with. Uh, with Hoffer, he thought that this could possibly help people with mental illness, mental illness. And, um, and so he, he started also using it with his patients. And I think Stan probably knew him and that kind of gave him, him the impetus. So again, I think it's in a way, it's so powerful that this, all of this is coming around again. And I hope we don't make the same mistakes that we did then. Yeah, I think that's everybody's fear that maybe lived through that time um, that you yeah. lived through in those early years. And I guess thinking about those early years um, and thinking about the generation that is starting to be more part of this research and kind of creating, you know, uh, this this new field. Um, <clears throat> What, what advice would you have? Um, what, what, did, what have you learned throughout all these years? And like, what yeah, advice would you impart on all of us? Be careful. Be sincere. Be some degree of humility. Because <laughs> I leave, you know, I see sometimes what happens is, you know, with some of these substances, a person becomes like the guru. And that's not going to be good. That's not going to work. That's again, like with the young man found all of these really false shamans. So I think that's one thing we really have to be careful about, you know, that people don't <laughs> have a messiah complex that I am the great one. I am the shaman and a shaman, by the way, when shaman get trained, they start when they're young children, sometimes four years old, even two years old. And they learn, they apprentice for decades. And so, again, as therapists who are using these MDMA and other substances, first of all, it's important that they've done their own work and their own integration into, into their bodily sense. And I think that's one of the things that I guess would just hope to impart that these are powerful, powerful substances. They have great potential in healing, but they also have limitations and they also have um, something like pitfalls that we have to be careful about, that we have to be cognizant about. And so my hope is, I, I really uh, appreciate that there is research going on with the use of psychedelics. Um, that's very, very positive. Uh, but even so, again, it still has to be really felt out, thought out, felt out, and people communicate with each other who are working with these, these substances. Yeah. Yeah, these are very powerful tools and, and catalysts. Um, and I think we have to be reminded about that. I want to come back to something quick, and then we'll start to wrap up here. I know um, we're almost at the hour. And it, and it kind of does come back to that notion of like not going right to the trauma. And I mm -hmm. believe it was in one of your books, because um, it, it had a big impact on me reading it. And I could be misquoting you. It's been a while. But I think you said something along the lines of... Um, the quote unquote primal therapies that came out of Esalen um, yeah. really kind of sometimes re triggered trauma for folks. Yeah. Um, right. And, you know, coming out of the breathwork world, you know, I really was like, no, I don't, I don't know. Like I've always had like really, you know, deep profound experiences with it, but I also had to sit with that notion and be a little bit honest with myself. I'm like, when did it go too hard? Like when did yeah. I have a, a big experience that actually wasn't yeah. beneficial? And I realized, yeah, there were times that I think I overdid it and blew my nervous system yeah. out. And so, I mean, do you have the same fear when it comes to psychedelics? Um, I do. I, oh, I definitely do. Yeah. I definitely do. You know, um, actually, this summer in Switzerland, I'm doing a, a postgraduate or a workshop 
uh, called, what was it called? Uh, breath and Consciousness. Yeah, so I'll be teaching that in Switzerland. But yeah, you can overdo it. You know, there's a certain seduction to what happens when we overdo it. And if we're overdoing something, it means, well, that we're overdoing it. And again, we have to be really careful about not overdoing it, whatever it is, whether it's breath work or psychedelic work. You know, one of the things about about breath work uh, is that when you do a very deep breathing uh, and do that for, you know, for a period of time, some because I know some of this breath work has people, you know, hyperventilating for an hour or even more. What, what happens is that the, our breath is controlled by the level of carbon dioxide in our blood. And if we hyper, not by the oxygen, but that by the carbon dioxide, when we hyperventilate, our, 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 le- our level go- of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of carbon dioxide goes very, very low. And so because of this, the blood supply to the brain is reduced. Now, you, you can lose the cortex and still survive, but you can't lose the, uh, what is it I want to call it? You can't lose the lower parts of the brain, mm. the brain stem and the limbic system. Yeah. They have to stay online. So what you're doing is you're taking the cortex offline and the cortex inhibits a lot of this but it, it but it may sometimes over inhibit it but it can also under inhibit it and so that explodes forth explodes outward with these very primitive raw things but they're very difficult to integrate because the cerebral cortex particularly the prefrontal prefrontal cortex has been taken on offline by the hyperventilation so it, when i usually work with breath or, you know, I don't see people privately anymore, but when I work with breath, I work really on the exhalation mm. of allowing a full breath, a full exploration, ex- ex- <laughs> yeah. exhalation. Uh, and then that really normalizes the whole um, brain systems and really gets an even breath that really fosters uh, connection, body connection. So, so I, I, I'm, I really uh, affirm and support you in, in realizing that it can be too much. And that, it, again, like anything, it has to be just enough. In somatic experiencing, we call that titration. Mm, yeah. And so we don't overload the person. And, what, you know, there's kind of like I talk about a window of tolerance. So if what you're doing doesn't reach that window, nothing's really happening. But if it's above that window, then too much is happening. But we want to be right in the middle of excitation and deepening relaxation so that the person really is feeling more regulated, more of the self. And uh, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and thanks for describing a little bit of the uh, the brain mechanism there. Um, it's always really fascinating um, to hear some of that stuff. Some people are just asking me about that. So hopefully, if they're listening, <laughs> they'll find that to be pretty helpful. Um, well, I see that we're at the hour. So I want to be respectful of your time. Um, definitely encourage everybody to check out the um, autobiography of trauma. Um, Thank you. Get that on audible if you want to listen to it that's what i did or read it if you're a book reader Um, yeah i think yeah it's on audible i've been listening to it which has been really great um is there any pictures though does it uh it might have i think it might come with a a a pdf of some stuff oh Um, okay yeah but is there anything that you want to close with any closing thoughts remarks you know in the last chapter of the book is called um living my dying Mm. and when I've really embodied that it was bringing together the reality of death but also reconnecting with the 18 month old the two year old self that was before some of the trauma 
and is oh, was always there living inside me and connecting with him as part of my oh beautiful and yeah. for those that are just listening you can check this video out on youtube and see the picture that dr levine is holding up okay yeah so i guess that's a bit about my story and i encourage you the readers to at least tell your own stories to yourself and to just go where that takes you to follow your truth as i followed mine beautiful well i think that is a wonderful way to end here so dr levine thank you so much for your time it's been a real pleasure and honor yeah oh good talking with kyle until next time right.